the nature and nurture of behavior. This is one of the main themes of psychology, as you will see as we proceed throughout the course. When you think about the biological aspect of psychology, one of the main things you have to think about is genes or our genes. And one of the easiest ways for those of us who aren't really science nerds, one of the easiest ways to think about a gene is as follows. The DNA is a library. The chromosome is a shelf in the library and the genes are the books on the shelf in that library. So the DNA is the entire packet of information. A huge library, but actually in this case microscopic, with a great deal of information in it. Genes are capable of synthesizing proteins, as you know from your science, and one of the key things that we'll be discussing in this unit and throughout the course is the idea that in fact genes are much like light switches. They can be turned on or turned off by the environment and this has tremendous implications for the development of the individual particularly uh, but not exclusively when it comes to issues of uh, the results of traumatic childhood abuse or on the positive side, the uh, stimulation, intellectual stimulation, which uh, might lead to higher cognitive abilities and possibly even increased intelligence over the lifespan. Think of the genome as being less like an ar architect's blueprint and more like a recipe. So you can put the ingredients for an organism in a bowl and mix them up, but just as no two cakes will be exactly the same, although they might look identical. In fact, no two organisms are exactly the same because, um, for one thing, the environment acts on the organism in slightly different ways, even though they are uh, made up of the same genome. Where this particularly comes into play, as we'll see in the first week or two of the course, or as we saw in the first week or two of the course, is with the idea of natural selection. And as you can see from the slide, natural selection does not mean survival of the fittest. What it means is that certain genes are able to adapt to a changing environment more than others, and therefore are able to replicate, whereas other organisms, because of an increase in temperature in, or in the environment, or in an increased level of predatory behavior by other organisms, or because of a, a change in the food supply, are not able to adapt, and those genes are not passed on to future generations through reproduction. This is an issue in psychology because there is a branch of psychology called evolutionary psychology, which is quite interesting which suggests that just as physically our bodies have been naturally selected over hundreds of thousands and millions of years according to uh, adaptation or in terms of adaptation to the environment so have our minds there uh, the evolutionary psychologists would argue that uh, the human mind is a product of natural selection just as the human body is and you can see that in a little bit more detail on this slide. One of the things that evolutionary psychology points out are some um, traits of the, the two sexes which are true across cultures and across time. When it comes to mate selection, at least when we're talking about heterosexual relationships, when it comes to mate selection, men did prefer in the evolutionary past and do prefer still attractive physical features in women that suggest youth and health. Whereas for the woman, although 
the looks of the man are important as cues to their overall health and therefore their ability to help look after offspring. Uh, women tend to look for men who have resources, i.e. money and social status. These are cues to the woman that in fact this man will be a good match for her for the uh, protection of the offspring and for supporting her over the long term. Behavior genetics likes to look at the relative power and limits of genetic and environmental influences on behavior and this ties in closely as you can imagine with evolutionary psychology although behavior genetics um, has more of an emphasis in the present than it does in the development of the species over time. And environment. When we talk about environment, this is something very important to get clear right from the beginning. When we're speaking of environment in psychology, we don't mean just the natural environment. Environment includes everything from uh, the uh, the quality of our uh, of our uh, life in um, in the womb, up to and including our family influences, our experiences at school, and the broader social network and uh, later on in life, our working lives, our married lives, and so on. So the environment is anything, essentially, that is non-genetic. Behavior geneticists like to consider identical twins. Identical twins are nature's clones. And even though they are nature's clones biologically, as we'll see later on, in fact, identical twins can be quite distinct psychologically and this has to do with a number of things non-genetic influences for example whereas one twin who is in a slightly different position in utero in the womb before birth has different environmental influences on their development for example may be able to hear the mother singing a little bit better and therefore will de develop slightly different psychologically from his or her partner in the womb interesting stuff. Behavior genetics is also interested in temperament, our emotional reactivity and intensity. For example, a person might carry around genes which may incline that person to being highly anxious, but those genes are never expressed because the person never experiences highly stressful situations, lucky person, to activate those genes. However, in another case with the same person carrying the same hardware on board where uh, their genes do predispose them to anxiety and they are born into a highly stressful situation. For example, uh, an abusive family situation or economic deprivation, economic hardship uh, during their early lives, then in fact the person may be inclined to becoming highly anxious. That's just one simple example of a number of possibilities when it comes to the uh, perspective of behavior genetics on individual development. And you can see a little bit more of behavior genetics in more detail on this slide. This refers to the kind of thing I was talking about just a couple of slides ago regarding uh, the influence of environmental inputs on the development of fraternal or identical twins. And we know that in the case of rats who have been used in the lab to study development over time, we know that rats who are raised in a, an impoverished environment, that is an environment which lacks stimulation, they don't have lots of rat friends to play with, they don't have rat toys to amuse themselves with, they don't have rat books to read to develop their intellectual skills and so on. Their brains, at least at the cell level, are less complex than the brains of rats who are raised in an enriched environment. Lots of other rats to play with, lots of toys to play with, lots of stimulating activity. This has tremendous implications 
for the influence of the environment on human beings, particularly in our early days, months, weeks, and years of life for the development of our brains. Children who are raised in a loving environment, in an enriched environment, children who are read to, children who, whose parents use language in a sophisticated and complex fashion, are children who enter school more ready to undertake the challenges of school work than children who unfortunately do not have those advantages. You can see this scan of a brain on the left side. You have a brain that has been trained in a certain skill. And what the red shows is glucose activity, that is brain activity, in that particular region. Now this looks like this person was being asked to perform a skill, just judging from the location on the brain, although I'm not sure. It looks like this person was being asked to perform a physical skill. And you can see on the right hand side, after much repetition and much practice, how much more of the brain has become devoted to that skill. And we'll see this more and more through the course. Your brain is very good at figuring out what's important to you and it will devote areas of itself to that skill. So if you're studying calculus again and again and again, your brain gets the picture. Hmm, calculus must be important. I better devote more of my area, more of my volume, more of my mass to processing calculus. Whereas if you're playing badminton again and again and again, same thing happens. The brain thinks to itself, hmm, badminton must be important, therefore I'm going to devote more of my area to processing the skills and challenges that badminton poses to me. Other environmental influences, the cultures in which we are raised, obviously, the beliefs, the religions, uh, and the broader culture, and of course family attitudes, all affect the way our brain's development. And just by way of definition, when we talk about norms, particularly when it comes to uh, psychological problems much later on the course, a norm is an understood rule for accepted and expected behavior. For example, in our culture, it is uh, normal for two men when being introduced to one another, normal but not, uh, not essential, to shake hands. Whereas in other cultures, two men being introduced to one another might uh, give a kiss on the cheek. Personal space, our need for personal space differs from culture to culture. And memes, this is something new in the, uh, or relatively new, certainly within the last 10 years, new to me, not necessarily new to you. I mean, um, <laughs> sorry, this is uh, devolving a little bit. Anyway, a meme is an idea, a fashion, an innovation that's passed on from person to person. And one of the things, I, one of the reasons psychologists are interested in this right now is because of the development of the internet and social media. Whereas ideas, for example, about how to dress appropriately in days gone by would have been relatively slow to develop because we didn't have the mass media that we have now and probably would have re remained stable over time. These days, the, uh, for example, a given movie star has cut his or her hair in a different way or is wearing a different sort of uh, sunglasses. That fashion will get through to everyone who is connected to the internet anyway very, very quickly and will start to influence people's behavior very quickly. This you know from your biology the chromosomal differences between men and women, male and female. And the role of testosterone in males. Now, oh, females have, uh, women have testosterone as well, but in much lower levels than men have. We'll look at the role of testosterone in male violence when uh, we come to that uh, later in the course and uh, you'll probably be surprised that it doesn't have the role in male violence that you might think it does. And another definition at the bottom of the slide regarding a role 
which is becoming more and more an issue uh, when it comes to gender issues in our society. We'll talk about that a little bit later on in the course as well. A bit more detail here on the nature and nurture of gender. And you can see an interesting study here on the issue of the fulfilling nature of being a housewife, whether or not being a housewife is a fulfilling activity. And the disagreement, as you can see at this particular study, was highest in Israel and lowest in Russia, which probably shows you differences in cultural beliefs and differences in gender stereotyping among these countries. And you can see the same kind of question here distributed over time. Look carefully about how attitudes change, especially for men, from the mid-60s to the early 2000s. A little more description of different theories regarding social learning and gender schema. and another diagram regarding gender typing. And we will look at this in more detail as the course goes on.